All right, hey guys, hey, just want to go through uh, this free response question in electrostatics. So um, I, I think we actually did this one early in the year, I can't remember. So, uh, but basically what you have is you have sphere one charged, you have sphere two uncharged, they're connected by a metal conductor, but they're really far distance apart. So there's no, how I interpret that is there's no charging by induction in any fashion, right? So um, basically what the question asks you is the switch is now closed, um, it first wants you to compare the electric potential. This is a pretty classic um, AP physics problem. And if we can get the idea of just that their potential should be the same, then everything else should fall into place based off of that. So here's why their potential is the same. So the electric potential of V1 and V2 has to be the same. Basically, they become one object. They become one conductor. Um, and any one conductor is going to have the same electric potential um, if it's connected in every place. Basically, if there wasn't the same electric potential, charge would still be trying to flow from one sphere to the other, right? Um, if there's a potential difference, right? Remember, that's why charges actually flow. So for things to be static, right? For those charges to actually stop, the electric potential has to be the same at all positions. So that's how we get the idea that V1 equals V2. Part two then asks, um, how does the charge on each of them compare? How does charge one compare to charge two? Um, and here's the idea. So we have an initial charge and we know that that charge then is going to move because this is charge and this is uncharged. And some of those, it doesn't want to say charge. I almost said it incorrectly, but basically what's going to happen, right? Is some of the electrons that are here are actually going to be attracted to this positive sphere one. So they're going to flow from sphere two to sphere one which will make sphere one a little bit less positive and make sphere two actually become now positively charged. But which one has more charge? Um, here's what we know. I'm gonna say Q1 is greater than Q2 and here's why. Basically, if we know that the potentials are the same, then the equation for electric potential, which is Q1 over four pi epsilon naught over R1 must equal Q2 over four pi epsilon naught R2. 4 pi epsilon naught, we can get rid of those. So it's basically just a ratio of Q1 over Q2 equals, or excuse me, Q1 over R1 must equal Q2 over R2. Here's what we know. R1 is much greater than R2. So Q1 then also must be greater than Q2 for those ratios to be the same. All right, going down to the third part, indicate how the electric fields compare, right? So here's what we know. Electric field is based on the charge four pi epsilon naught over R squared. Um, what we just said from the last one is that R1 or Q over R is the same for each of them. So that ratio Q over R is the same. So basically we can simplify this equation. Again, four pi epsilon naught is the same as well. Um, so this equation kind of simplifies down to the electric field is um, equivalent to one over R. Again, since R, this now is an inverse relationship, since R1 is bigger than R2, now E2 must actually be bigger than E1. So even though their electric potentials are the same, their electric fields are different and the charges on each of them must be different. Okay. Part B, um, we're now going to cut that wire. We're going to allow them to move apart and it wants you to not solve, so you don't have to go through, but write equations to help you figure out how we would know what the velocities would be. So um, basically Q1 and Q2 are gonna have an electric force pushing them apart. Their initial velocities are going to be zero. This is a high potential energy. I forgot to write energy there, but this is a high potential energy situation, right? Where um, basically if things have the potential for something to happen, uh, again, as we remove those closer and closer, it's going to be more and more that they want to push each other apart. So that's a high potential energy. As they move apart, that's going to be a low potential energy situation, right? So uh, in terms of energy, how can we think of that? The one equation we have is a change in energy is Q times delta V, right? Um, the change in energy then is Q and V, the potential, is 1 over 4 pi or K, Q over D, right? And so that equation then breaks down into K, Q1, Q2 over D. Now, a change in energy means they're going from zero velocity or no kinetic energy to some kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy they're going to have 
after they push apart is going to be 1 half mv squared plus 1 half mv squared. So they're both going to gain some kinetic energy, right? Um, so we have this equation. We have two velocities, though, that are unknown. So we have to come up with another way that we can actually solve for one of those velocities or substitute one of those values in. Um, we can use that using the idea of conservation of momentum, right? So initially, those things are not moving. They have an initial momentum of zero. So finally, after, they have to also have a momentum of zero, right? Which means they're not going to move at the same speed because they are not the same mass, right? The lighter one has to be moving a little bit faster than the heavier one. They have the same force. Electrostatic force is the same, but because this one has is smaller and has a smaller mass, it's going to have a bigger acceleration, okay? So basically what we can say is mass plus mass times velocity initial, which again, this whole side is zero, is going to equal mass one to velocity one plus mass two times velocity two, which tells me mass one times velocity one equals mass two times velocity two. Now I have two equations with two unknowns and I could substitute V1 in here, right? And I could solve for what V2 is um, or vice versa, okay? The last thing then, part C asks for how the uh, spheres are now returned to their original locations. Um, we're gonna charge and then, or connect the wire, disconnect it again, and then we're gonna bring some sp sphere three. So that's kind of why you have this sphere three, which is much larger than R1 and R2, right? So initially, what are their signs? So essentially what we have, again, there's no induction. This is how I'm interpreting it, um, is basically everything's gonna be positive, right? Sphere one's going to uh, lose some of its positive charge because electrons from sphere two are going over to it. So sphere two is also gonna be positive, but then they're disconnected again. And so Q3, which is neutral, is going to come over. Some of its electrons are jumping over into Q2 because Q2 is positive already. Um, and so we basically have the same process that sphere one did to sphere two, that sphere three does to sphere two, right? So to me, they're all positive in the end, right? Um, rank then the absolute value of the final charge. Well, here's what we know. Uh, we already said, sorry, I'm kind of scrolling all over the place. We already said Q1 is greater than Q2 um, for the purpose that their electric potentials are the same and that it's a ratio of their charge to their radius, right? So because the bigger radius of R1, the charge must also be bigger on R1. So here's how I broke this down. Um, Q1 is the biggest. Then uh, the charge on 2 is going to be split between 3 and 2. Uh, 3, however, is going to be bigger than 2 for this exact reason. I didn't write it out, um, but essentially this exact same reason. Because their potentials, when they are touching, they would be one conductor, so their potentials would have to be the same which means their charges would be based on this ratio Q1 over R1, or in this case, Q2 over R2 and Q3 over R3. Because R3 is greater than R2, Q3 must be greater than Q2, right? So hope that uh, explains a little bit about that. Let me know if you have any questions.